And now he goes around the country and advising very wealthy people on the acquisition of art. Uh, he was in New York at, uh, at Kennedy. He walks into the, the high-end uh, uh, airport lounge, looking around, and suddenly he sees over in the corner, this person is sort of lying casually, but he saw the cowboy boots, the Warren Levi's, a true Western Roundup shirt, some sort of a vest, and a well-worn cowboy hat. And this guy, who's a very discriminating man about art and books, said, my God, Craig Johnson's on the plane. <laughs> and I don't know if he ever made contact, but your very presence there made it an easier trip for him. Made him want to get off, right? Well, no, right? no. Uh, uh, this is, I've, I've been doing interviews as a journalist my whole life, and I will say to this, hoping I don't, or not me, he, will not disappoint us, this is one of the finest interview guys you can find. Oh, boy. If I had some sort of a terrible seizure <laughs> 25 minutes into this, I could just sort of collapse over here and he'd keep right on going. You know, I'd be, we, this would go on until the medics arrived. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I think Notice he doesn't say in either a good or bad way. He just says that I will go on, you know, so. Yeah, no. Let's, I, I think it'd be interesting for the people who have, like I, have found such great authenticity in your books not just in the, in, the, in the Wyoming that many of us know and admire and enjoy and at times fear for, but the characters, the incredible range of characters, all of whom run true. And you were born on the East Coast. Uh, yeah, I like that, but I had family scattered all the way up and down the Rocky Mountain region like that. And, uh, I mean, the, the, the key element there, like that, I think, you know, one of my favorite quotes is the one from Wallace Stegner where he says, the greatest piece of fiction ever written is the disclaimer at the beginning of every book that says, nobody in this book is based off anybody alive or dead. Like, and, <laughs> and what a crock that is. I mean, that's your job to go out and find interesting people and populate, you know, your books with them. And so, you know, that, that's the great thing about writing in Wyoming is, is that it's, it's not like everywhere else. Thank it's, goodness. Uh, yeah, Thank yeah. Goodness. It's. Uh, what did your parents do? Uh, my father was an engineer, like, and my mother was a teacher. And uh, you know, they. I, I think I was supposed to be an engineer, like that, but that that didn't work out really well, like, and uh, and so then I, I started being a writer, like, and I don't think. I don't, we'll as far get to as, you. We'll get to your being a writer. Well, as far as they were concerned, that oh. didn't that didn't work out really yeah. well either, like that. I mean, you know, <laughs> before my mother passed away, the first thing she asked me was, you know, she said, "Well, what kind of a retirement do you have, you know, as a writer?" Like, and I said, "Mom, writers don't retire. You just write, hopefully, the end, and then collapse, you know, over the keyboard, <laughs> and that's the end of it, you know." So, where'd you go to school? Uh, a couple of different places, like that, and uh, my education surprise was actually in writing. I just didn't let that get in the way of becoming a writer, um, which is one of the key elements there. Like that, I, I think you know that it, it's a problem, like that, because I mean, it, 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 people say you know, it seems like you started late uh, in your writing career, and I think I was in my forties, like that, and I, I thought I started pretty early. I thought what I was did you do really well. between eighteen and forty? Oh, everything. You name it. Any of it successful? Uh, no, none of it. Like that, and uh, <laughs> you know, so just by the you know, limitations of like bouncing around like a pinball, I finally bounced into something that it, it seemed like I could do. Like that, and uh, and that's that's kind of the way I approach the books. Is like you know, like storytelling. Like that. I mean, you know, the books are written in first person. I mean, it's Walt. You know, and I mean, some of the best stories I've ever heard. Um, in my life, you know, have been like either crouched over a, a campfire, like at or sitting on a porch, you know, in a rocking chair, listening to somebody start off a story with, let me tell you about what happened to me. And, uh, and that's the way I like the books to be. I like whenever, you know, you open that book, I don't even want you to remember that you're reading a book. I want you to just fall into that world and be a part of it. Did you leave the East Coast for the West Coast with a long mire in your mind? Or did Longmire come to you in the West? No, I, I delivered horses down out of Montana and, uh, and found that little place where I built my ranch, U-Cross, um, which has a population of 25. 
Um, 23 today because Judy and I are here, and uh, and so you know I mean I, I you know I, you know I, I wanted to build my own ranch like it and so you know I built my own place I poured the concrete stacked the logs you know did it all myself like it and then um, and were then were you alone in that time? Yeah, pretty much like to an extent like I was still trying to coerce my wife who was from Philadelphia to come to U Cross Wyoming population 25 like and uh, that might be the greatest you know. <laughs> Uh, climax of my life, like it was actually, you know, getting her to move there. But uh, it was, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, and, and it's always two reasons. There are two reasons why you become a writer. You know, A, um, you stumble onto a story that you think is worth telling and that maybe nobody's told to death. Um, and then the other one is you finally run out of excuses. And that's what happened when I finally got that part of the house, you know, that little cabin, a little log cabin, about 24 by 32. Um, I got it built and I was out of excuses. And I was like, okay, you know, you've always wanted to write this novel. Now would be the time to sit down and actually try and write this Did novel. Did you know it was a Western novel? Yeah, I knew it was going to take place in Wyoming. Um, I had run into two DCI investigators in Wyoming. DCI where, being? Being Division of Criminal Investigation uh, in Wyoming, where we have one crime lab in the whole state, down in Cheyenne, six hours away. And, uh, and this was back, you know, whenever the, the CSI stuff was really, really popular, you know, and so I asked them, I said, how long does it take you guys to get DNA evidence? And they looked at each other and then looked at me and said, is this a high profile case? And I said, well, let's pretend like it is. And they go about nine months. And I was like, okay, so that's not really particularly honest what they're doing in these TV shows and in these books and everything. And they go, no, it's not. Like, and so I started thinking about it and I thought, well, what if you did a procedural where the protagonist was the sheriff of the least populated county in the least populated state in America, and lo and behold, Walt was born. Uh, Walt was born. Who defined Walt? Who is the definition of Walt? Oh, that, that's difficult. And like did a, he come, was he born perfectly No, formed? no, 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 no. He, he's evolved, you know, and I think that that's one of the key elements, you know, when you're writing a series, I think, you know, you'd probably agree, like, uh, that, you know, if you're writing a series of books, the worst thing you can do is, like, come in with a, you know, fully formed idea, you know, blown from the head of Zeus, you know, I think, you know, you need to allow those characters to evolve and to change, like that, and, uh, you know, I, I was lucky like that because I did a lot of ride-alongs with a lot of sheriffs there in Wyoming and Montana, and they were hilarious guys like that because there was a transition going on from you know all of that technology and and the litigation of you know of law enforcement and all of that that changed a great deal from the time that I met a lot of these guys like that and they were very free you know with uh, with a lot of their information the the sheriff of Johnson County um, who you know was essential you know to to the writing of the very first book the cold dish was a fellow by the name of Larry Kirkpatrick and uh, I had gone in and introduced myself to him he um, said, my name's Craig Johnson, I've got a little ranch out near U-Cross, and I've got a, um, a, a mystery novel that I'm writing that's, you know, got a sheriff, you know, as a protagonist, you know, and he promised to help me, and I was so thrilled that, you know, I'd solved that problem that I went home and added on to my ranch, and, um, and then added on to it again, added on to it again, like, and then finally came back to the ranch one day, like, and opened up the third drawer down on the right-hand side, and those two lonely little chapters of the cold dish were looking up at me, and ten years had gone by. <laughs> 10 years like it and I you know and I thought this is going to be embarrassing because if I'm going to restart this novel I'm going to have to go and, and reintroduce myself to him because there's no way he's ever going to remember me. I'd voted for him three times, you know, because I, you know, but I hadn't spoken a word to him. Like that. And so I was trying to work up the nerve to go in and speak with him again and get restarted on the cold dish and uh, I remember going into town like that and putting gas in my truck and as I'm standing there, you know, filling the truck up with gas like at this police cruiser pulls in on the other side of the pump island like that and so I'm standing there like that you know and this guy arrives like that and he you know gets out starts filling up his cruiser like that and he's looking at me like that and he's giving me this funny look like that you know and the look was one of those looks that said what did I arrest you for and when was it you know and so and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking uh, this is going to be even worse than I thought because it's going to be in public like that and so I, I stuck my hand out and I said Sheriff Kirkpatrick you're probably not going to remember me and he goes your name's Craig Johnson you're the one that's got the little ranch out near you cross and you're the one that's writing a murder mystery mystery about a Wyoming sheriff. <laughs> I was like, this was a 10-minute conversation from 10 years previous. And I looked at him and I go, that is absolutely amazing. And he goes, yeah, yeah, if you don't mind me saying so, this book of yours is going kind of slow. <laughs> <laughs> so that pissed me off. Like I, but, you know, it kind of got the ball rolling at least a little bit, you know. But, uh, but the, the, and that was, you know, kind of essential, I think, you know, in, in trying to, like, you know, put Walt together because I didn't want Walt to be one of those, you know, six foot two of twisted steel and sex appeal, you know, every, every woman wanted him, every man feared him, you know, kind of like, you know, 
criminal you know, fiction protagonist. I wanted him to be more like us. <laughs> I wanted him to be over. I wanted him to be overweight, over age, overly depressed, you know, but, you know, still one of those guys that got up in the morning and tried to do the job, you know, and to me, that's true heroism. And that was the guys that I saw out there, you know, trying to do the job. You know, I mean, there are counties in Wyoming that are as big as Maryland, you know, and then you've got a staff of like a half a dozen people, you know, to try and, you know, do the law enforcement for that kind of an area. It's kind of, it's a tough job, tough job. <laughs> The, uh, did, do, do the people, uh, the, the, the town that you're closest to is, help me. You, you cross is the town yeah, in, but in the, where Ranch is. Buffalo. 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 Uh, what do they think of the books? Do they're, people they're, there read your books? Well, they, you know, they, they, you know, it's it's interesting because the ranchers around me they don't they don't give a shit what, about my books at all. Like okay, they <laughs> they just like you know how about that fence like you got on the north side of your pasture? You're gonna get that fixed. You know they're much more you know, interested in that type of thing. Like that, but uh, Buffalo is interesting like that because it's kind of the basis for Durant. Um, and kind of the basis, you know, for Johnson County being the basis for Absaroka County. And the reason that I went, you know, with a fictitious county also goes back, you know, to Larry Kirkpatrick, that sheriff I was discussing. Um, I remember uh, when I was doing ride-alongs with him, you know, he, the first thing he said to me is, you got a mistake. You got two mistakes in the first chapter. And I said, well, what's that? Look at me. He goes, well, first of all, you got people drinking beer out of bottles on a bar out on the Powder River. And I was like, and that's a problem because, he goes, it's can-only bars on the Powder River, Craig. And I said, why? Do you mind if I ask why? And he goes, yeah, it's hard to hurt somebody with a can. <laughs> you know? And I said, well, what if it's full? And he goes, nobody ever threw a full can in Wyoming, Craig. Okay? And so, so that was one. Like, and then the next one was, you know, when you turn right on Ford Street, the next street up on the left isn't you know, Silverton. Like, and I thought, oh, I'm not fighting that crap for the rest of my life. Like, I said, hello, fictitious <laughs> county. And, uh, and so then it kind of took the pressure off Buffalo and Johnson County as being like the model. Uh, for the books. In 1970, I went to Buffalo uh, to do for Charles Kuralt a piece on the uh, on the big war, the, uh -huh. the big cattle war yes. there. And the guy who owned the major bank I was drinking with one night at the American Legion Hall, and he said this was the the town had one powerful radio station owned by an old <clears throat> Basque widow who every morning would get up and start playing Basque music on the radio station, which nobody in town could understand. And he said... And you would also hear a glass with ice, and we're not quite sure what, <laughs> rattling in the background as she talked while she was changing the Basque That's records. Right. So. He said to me, I will finance your buying this radio station if you will come out here and run it. And I sat there and thought, that would be great fun, but I had a wife and a couple kids somewhere else, and that was not me. There you go. Tell them about <laughs> Buffalo. I think it's a really interesting town. Oh, it is. Like it's uh, in a lot of ways. You know, if you read the books, like that, or even if you watch the TV show, like that, you you probably have a good sense. You know, of what Buffalo is like. It's about four thousand people, like that, and so it's a small town. Like I mean, not that small by Wyoming standards, but you know, certainly by every other standard. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's nestled right there at the base. You know, of the Bighorn Mountains. Um, but it's one of those areas in Wyoming where at the base of the Bighorn Mountains that actually the, the altitude drops down low enough to where there's water and there are trees. Look at, and that's two items to never be overlooked whenever you're talking about the western landscape, both water and trees, because generally the two just don't come. And so it's, you know, it's, a, it's a beautiful little spot, but still you know, relatively unknown, you know, because most people are kind of in a hurry to get from either the Black Hills like at, or Yellowstone like that along the way going back and forth. Um, and so it was kind of perfect, you know, for my purposes as far as, you know, writing the books. Um, nobody was probably going to argue with me about the majority of the, the factual aspects of the books. Like, and then when I decided to do it fictionally, it really didn't matter at all. Like, I could have done whatever I wanted. But uh, it, it's kind of a fun thing, like, to have, you know, the books sit there. It's kind of fun. It's turned out to be even more fun, I think, probably for the TV show. Like, that, because um, we have this thing called Longmire Days. Um, there in Buffalo, like that, and uh, every once a year, like at in the summertime, the entire cast from the TV show comes up to Buffalo um, with about twenty thousand of their closest friends, like that, and 
it's every bit the unnatural disaster that you are imagining right now is what it is. Like, because all the grocery stores and all the restaurants run out of food. All the banks and ATM machines run out of money. And everybody walks around with their cell phones looking at the little blue circle of death, you know, because they've overrun the amount of you know, bandwidth there is on the one little tower that's in Buffalo. Look at, and they're all wandering around trying to get their cell phones to work. And I'm walking up to them and going, now you know why Walt doesn't carry a cell phone, don't you? Like that. And so, but... Uh, it is uh, to the north of us, like it is the Northern Cheyenne Reservation and the Crow Reservation. Like well, you, Walt's, to the north. Walt's uh, <laughs> uh, sidekick is a very interesting, engaging, and in no way patronized Native American. Thank you. Uh, talk about him. Where did he come from? Well, once again, look at it's another one of those issues where, you know, I, I've got a lot of friends and neighbors like uh, who are right up there on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. And so it's kind of essential like uh, that I... First of all, it, that I have them in the books. So whenever I'm reading a Western book, you know, especially about my part of the world of, of the West, you know, because there are, you know, it's very, very different, a lot of different parts of the West. Um, it's it, it would be criminal for me to not have them be a part of that. You know, they're an essential part of the life, you know, and then and everything, you know, that that makes up, you know, that part of the high plains. Um, but then again, look at it's also essential, look at that I be honest about them, like that, you know. And and there are two different ways you can go. I mean, you can over like romanticize, you know, them as a people, you know, where they become in, they they're, they're not human anymore, like that they become this you know, this archetype, like that that's uh, more palatable, like that, and that's not fair, like that. And then you can demonize them as they've been demonized, you know, for the majority of their existence, you know, certainly in the media and you know in uh, movies and television, books, whatever, like that. And so, you know, the 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 trick is trying to shoot for the middle, like that, to try and find the truth, you know, of what they, they really are like. like that, and that's complex. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of interaction. And I spend a lot of time, you know, up on the reservation like that with my good friends. Like that, and once again, you know, I can go down the list of every single, you know, Indian character in my books. And I do say Indian. I don't say Native American because my Indian friends all make fun of me whenever I try and say Native American. They always look at me and go, where were you born? <laughs> And I go, I've, I was born in America. So you would be a Native American too then, wouldn't you? <laughs> so, and so, you know, for me, like, that's one of the joys, like that, you know, but, but then again, you know, I mean, if you ever came to my part of the world, you'd probably see the majority of the people that are in my books walking around and you would say, he's not really that good of a writer. He just knows a lot of interesting people is all it is. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Describe the friend, the Native American, the Indian. Oh well, um, it's it, the the character of uh, of Henry Standing Bear is based off a good friend of mine, Marcus Red Thunder, um, who I've been friends with for I don't know a quarter of a century now, like that. And uh, he most certainly has you know the, the the a lot of the aspects of Henry, um, but mostly the spirituality. He just has a, a wonderful spirituality about him, and you know the Native spirituality is is not a you know, it's not a Sunday spirituality. It, it infuses, you know, every aspect of their lives, every aspect of, you know, every, everything about them. Like, it's, it's a constant source um, of energy for them. Like that. And so he, he captures that, I think, a great deal. And the other thing that it, he captures so wonderfully is the sense of humor. Um, I don't think there's ever been a group of individuals that's been more maligned as not having a sense of humor as much as the American Indian. I mean, they're always portrayed as these stoic cigar store, how, you know, kind of characters. That ain't the Indians I know. The Indians I know work on about 17 different layers of irony. And if you're not aware of that irony, you get to be the butt of that irony. Like, and so, you know, it's always very, I'm very, you know, very sharp trying to, you know, pick that up as much as I can because it's, uh, it's essential to the process, I think. And so, you know, it, when it came time, you know, especially when I was writing that first book, which wasn't really even supposed to be a series, it was supposed to be a standalone book, I needed two characters that were going to be um, emblematic of uh, these two cultures, the two major cultures that are on the high plains, you know, the native culture and the mainstream white culture. Like, and I you know, thought, well, you know, Walt will have to be emblematic because simply because he's involved you know, with the investigation. And then I thought, okay, you know, Henry. Henry will be the, 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 the one that will represent the native culture. The, uh, you finished the book. How did it get published? 
Ah. Were you ever rejected? Did people say this book was not commercial or whatever? You know, this is the story that usually makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck, you know, because it's probably the one where if, if I die at a book festival, this will be because I was telling this story because another author planted a butcher knife in the back of my, you know, back of my back here between my, uh, my spine. Like, um, I, you know what? I was really extraordinarily fortunate. Like that I, uh, I, I did a, uh, you know, made some phone calls like, a, you know, to New York. York, like had to find out, you know, which agents would be remotely, you know, interested in a contemporary Western, um, you know, hopefully with a little bit of a literary kind of a tinge to it, but, you know, with a lot of humor, um, more, you know, involved with character like that. And, you know, amazingly enough, about a half a dozen of them, you know, were interested. And so we jumped on a plane. Look at we flew to New Who York. Who was we? My wife and I. My mm-hmm. wife, my, my wife Judy here in the front row. Look at we we flew to New York. Look at and we went around and you know went to all of these you know different agents and uh, the majority of them it was like a Damon Runyon novel. Look at you know you'd walk up floor flights you know and then they would like <laughs> open the door like this much you know just enough for you to slide the manuscript through you know and the cigar smoke would come up through the transom and you'd hear somebody go sure kid we'll let you know like you know. I'm still waiting to hear from them. Like, and you hear it going in the trash can as you were walking back towards the stairs. Like, a, and then there was one. There was one. We finally got to the last one, and my wife had had it. She, she had just, you know, we, you get kicked in the teeth so many times, you just don't want to do it anymore. Like, and so she stayed downstairs, like there in Times Square, um, and was down there, you know, drinking, I don't know, lattes and espressos and all this. Like, and I went upstairs, you know, and met with this one agent. Like, and this one agent, uh, this this uh, this meeting turned, you know, from a ten minute meeting into like an hour long meeting like that where we just talked about you know what the book was about what the characters were about all these different things and um by the time I got done, she said, you know, well, I'm not going to have a chance, you know, to read this quickly because I've got to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair, but I will read it and I will give you a response. And I was like, well, that's, you know, more than anybody's been willing to give me for a week now. So I'm, I was delighted with that. And I got back downstairs and Judy was waiting for me at the coffee shop after drinking like about five espressos. And she said, so you were up there for a long time. And like, did it go well? It seemed like you were there and up there for a long time. So I must have gone well. But you wanted to talk about it. It seemed like it must have gone well. I guess so. And I was like, I don't know. I, I give up. I don't really know anymore. Like it. And so by the time we got back to the ranch um, in Wyoming, the answering machine was blinking, and that was uh, Gail Hockman of Brand Hockman Associates, and she said, don't give this to anybody else. I want it. Like that. And then she introduced me to Catherine Court over at Viking Penguin, and uh, like a year later, I was on the shelves. So one of those Cinderella stories. And how quick was the celebration? Ah, uh, define of, celebration. Of, you know, the, that you found an audience. Oh, how quick did that audience appear? It happened pretty fast. I mean, you know, by my rating, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, it happened pretty quick. I mean, you know, you're just, you know, stunned, you know, whenever um, I, I just remember them sending me the tip in sheets like tip in sheets are um, the sheets that they send you, you know, whenever they're going to have you sign something and they're just going to publish it. They're going to you know, bind it in the book so that there's a, a ready made, you know, a signature in the book. And they, they sent me 5000 tip in sheets. Um, for the cold dish, look at it. And I thought that I would knock those out, you know, in, in one evening, drinking a couple of beers. <laughs> you know how many times it takes you to sign your name? 5,000 times? Look at it. It takes a little bit longer than more than two beers, I can tell you that much. Like, and I think that was probably when I started thinking, huh, this is, this is maybe on a little bit larger scope than I thought it was going to be. And it, and it was clear early that you had a a story? I guess enough so that Viking Penguin thought, you know, that it was a series like that, which wow. I, which I didn't, I, I got to admit, you know, I mean, I remember sitting there, you know, with Catherine Court in New York, you know, with the manuscript of the cold dish sitting in front of us like that. And she said, um, we really would like you to think about doing this as a series. We think these characters, this place, um, there's a lot more stories like that that could be told. And that's when I, with the knowledge of not even having had one book published yet, started arguing with the president of Penguin and going, oh, I don't think that'll work. I don't think that's a really good idea. But I got some other ideas I want to bounce off of. And she was like, why don't you go back to your ranch and think about this? Look at, and so, so I did, you know, and, and I started thinking about it. And the big question was, of course, well, do these characters have more stories to tell? And um, I might have like neglected to tell you that the first draft of the cold dish was about 650 pages long. It was like war and peace in Absaroka <laughs> County was what it was like. And so I had to chop like about you know 250 some pages out of this thing. You know, so you had stories. <laughs> I did. I had another novel laying there waiting to get published. You know, so <laughs> the the uh, the television series. How did that come about? And and ultimately. 
are you pleased with what they did? It was, it was uh, another one of those you know, weird things. Like it, it was kind of a package deal you know, with CAA um, and the agents, like it, or the, the producers rather, involved, um, which was a little bit of a surprise like that because I actually got to meet you know, all the people that were involved you know, with the, the possibility of trying to turn Walt you know, into a, a television show. And, uh, and I, remember, you know, I remember sitting there with, uh, across the, the table from Greer Shepard um, the head producer, like that, and um, I remember her. You know, they, I did what they normally tell you to do. You know, in job, you know, interviews. You know, they always tell you ask questions yourself. And so there was one raging question that I had to ask, and I finally looked at her and I said, "Why in the world do you want to make a TV show out of the sheriff of the least populated county and the least populated state in America? What in the world are you guys thinking?" Like, and she looked at me and she goes, "You know, we've kind of been having this like anti-hero thing going." you know, since the 1960s, and I keep thinking that maybe it's about time for one of these, like, a real blue ribbon kind of hero, a guy that's got a code that he lives by, who's not, you know, mixing up meth in his bathtub, who's not burying bodies in his backyard or something like this, that, you know, that really is a good guy, that really cares about the people in his constituency, is, you know, trying to, you know, make the world a better place. Look at, and I, I was kind of taken by that. I was kind of surprised by it, and I thought, okay, and, um, and then, you know, that's just the beginning, you know, whenever, you know, whenever you get one of those calls like that, because, uh, you know, then you have to go through the whole process of the casting and, you know, and then the, you know, you got to find a network and you have to do all of these things. And I think, you know, probably the turning point on that one was probably whenever they sent me the DVDs of the auditions for the actors that they were looking at. Um, because I don't know if you know, you're looking at a, an executive creative consultant is what you're looking at, <laughs> <laughs> and what that means is, is I know where the porta potties are on set. Like, and so, they, uh, they, it was, you know, it, it was. I thought I'd gotten away from something because they asked me. They said, you know, well, who do you see as Walt Longmire? And I said, I, I don't really. And they said, you don't think about actors? And I said, no, I, I don't. I've got real people that I use as you know characters and bits and pieces of different people that I use as characters in the books. And they said, well, if you were to think about actors to play Walt Longmire, who do you think of? And I said, I, you know, I'm kind of out of touch. I guess, you know, Joel McRae, um, <laughs> you know, Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson. But Gary Cooper would be a really great, you know, Walt Longmire. And they said that was no help because all those guys have been dead for 40 years. Okay, and so I told them, I said, I'm not going to be much help to you guys because I just, I don't know that much about Hollywood. You know, I mean, you know, our little town doesn't have a movie theater in it, so it's not like I have a lot of opportunities there. And so... It was a surprise whenever that FedEx box arrived, you know, from Warner Brothers um, that had all the audition DVDs, uh, you know, that for all these guys that they were attempting to, you know, cast as Walt Longmire. And it was interesting because they had like two different ways they could go. They could either go with somebody who was a big name um, that would draw an audience, you know, to the show, or they could go with someone who was a relative unknown. And I was kind of rooting for the relative unknown just simply because... You know, for me, like that, you know, if you use a big name, the problem is, is that you don't really look at them as the character. You look at them as this conglomeration of all these roles that they've played. And you guys know as well as I do that if it's a character that wears one of these, you know, there's about a half a dozen guys that get that role in Hollywood over and over and over again these days. Like, and so I was kind of rooting for the unknown guy. Well, the problem with the unknown guy is, is that, you know, that Walt is of a certain age. You know, Walt is of a certain age, look at, and so, you know, you, you're, you got to have an actor who's like, what, in his 50s or 60s, right? Well, if you're in Hollywood, and you're an actor, and you're in your 50s and 60s, and you're unknown, <laughs> you might suck, you know? And, um, you know, and Hollywood's really nervous about the whole suck thing, you know? And so, so it was, uh, you know, but I was still rooting for the unknown guy, like, and so we've got these DVDs, we're sitting there, my wife and I, Judy, we're sitting there at the ranch, and so, you know, I've got this whole box full of DVDs, like it. And so I thought, well, we got some homework to do, like it. And so I start putting the DVDs in the DVD player, like it. And we're watching all these DVDs. And um, I don't know, they're, they're all good. They're, they're all the actors were really good, like that. But none of them are really clicking for me, like it. And we got to the very last DVD, the very last one. And, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that's the way they planned it when they rubber banded them together. And, uh, and so I remember pulling out the sleeve, look at it, and it said Robert Taylor on it. And I was like, well, they took my advice after all, didn't they? Like, thank God you guys laugh. The under 30 crowd does not get the Robert Taylor joke at all, okay? And so I, I you know, we I took the, the, that's the last one, look at it, and I put the DVD in, and this guy comes on. He's rangy, you know tall guy, like I got a gravelly voice. And the great thing about him is he has lines on his face. 
You know, he's got seasoning to him. Like that. And I'm thinking, okay, this might work. This might be the guy. Like that. And about then, that's when my wife, sitting behind me, goes, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I turn around, I look at her, and she digs her hole a little bit deeper. She's like, you know, he's kind of like a TV version of you. Taller, better looking, with a better voice. Like that. So, <laughs> so I'm not as big of a fan of Robert Taylor as I used to be. Like that. So, <laughs> And what did you think of the productions? I think they did a wonderful job. I mean, there are limitations as to what you can do um, in 42 minutes. I mean, like I have to say that to you. Like that, I mean, you know, it, one, television production is wonderful, but it is limited um, to the 42-minute you know, mark there. You know, because when we were on regular cable television, you know, we had commercial breaks like that, and went on uh, A&E. Like and, um, and one of the first things the producers said to me, they said, you know, your books don't break down to a 42-minute teleplay very easily. And my response to that was, thank God. If they did, you shouldn't be reading them. And, uh, and they said, you know, well, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take bits and pieces, you know, from different books like that and then, you know, work up our own scenarios like that to be able to do this. And I was okay with that. I, re I kind of realized that it was a, a different art form. You know, it's kind of like singing about painting. You know, you have to, you know, be open to the idea that there might be some changes. Uh, Kathleen and I lived for a year. Next, we were next door neighbors of Philip Roth, who we didn't oh. see that much of. But a good friend of ours produced his movies, and he, the friend, was terrified that Philip Roth was going to start showing up on the set with all sorts of opinions of casting and whatever. And Philip Roth said, "That's a different world. I have no interest in it. Mm -hmm. Nothing I can do." I may not even watch it. And off he went and wasn't heard from. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately you would, I think there's a net general attitude in Hollywood where they wished more and more original source people right. would step back right. and uh, give them the benefit of the doubt. Well, it's like any other, any other business. I mean, the, the only thing, you know, the, the most control you have is that moment before you sign on the dotted line. Um, you know, you're going to be looking at the people that you're going to be working with and judging them to see if they're really going to do what it is that you, you know, can live with, you know. Um, and so I was able, when I was able to meet those producers and see, you know, what it was that they had done before, you know, I, I felt, you know, relatively comfortable like that with uh, what it was that they were going to do like that and, and still am, to be honest. Well, this is probably a terribly unfair question. Uh, do you read other writers of the, of the West? I do. Uh, and I don't mean just in your in your genre, uh -huh. but writers. You you referenced uh, uh, one of the great writers earlier. Who do you read? Who do you think captures the American West? Not only the historical movie version uh -huh. or non-historical version of, but who do you like? Who do you read? Oh my goodness! Look at there, there's so many different directions that you can go. Um, with a question like that. Um, I tell you how I got into trouble once, like, and I always love telling this, this story in California. Um, I, I was at a Western Writers of America uh, conference one time and on a panel, and they asked all of us, they said, who's your favorite Western writer? And when they got to me, I was at the end, and I said, John Steinbeck. And they all looked at me and said, he's not a Western writer. And I was like, California is about as far west as you can get, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I guess what I love about him is his ability to, to paint a large picture. I mean, he painted with such an incredibly large canvas, but did it with character. He did it with human beings and did it on a scale um, that I think, you know, it would be very, very difficult for anybody else to ever try and do what it is that he did. Okay. Now I have enough. Before I ask this question, we have about uh, 11 minutes to go. I'm sure this is not authorized by the generalissimo of <laughs> this organization, but I'd like to get some questions out of the audience. So I'm going to ask you one question, and then we'll turn to the room and see what the room wants to know. Okay. Western movies. Who are your Western heroes, and what is your favorite Western movie? Oh, you know... Um God, that's another one that's tough. Look at, I gotta admit, look at, um, the, the, this is kind of heresy, look at, but I, I will say it anyway. Um, I think that, you know, the, the Magnificent Seven, um, is an absolutely incredible film. It really, really is. And I think it's even better than Kurosawa's original film. For one, now this is really awkward. I know. I mean, I, you're I, making I, that I, reach. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> 
<laughs> but there, there's a reason for that. And uh, Eli Wallach. Eli Wallach is the bad guy. Um, the Kurosawa film is wonderful simply because, you know, it's just beautiful. Like that. And, but the bad guys are just these images of guys behind the barricades riding their horses back and forth like that. And I think Eli Wallach does the best job of explaining his position as an antagonist in just about any movie I've ever seen in my entire life. Like that. So probably probably The Magnificent Seven, I have to admit. A guilty pleasure. I, I have purchased your new book, which is set in Mexico. It is. And uh, I was jolted and was uneasy with it. And I put it back, and now I'm going to read it. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I think it's really uh, uh, courageous to take a step like that when you have such a vivid image in everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably healthy for your characters to get out of, out of, out of, out of Wyoming uh -huh. to uh, whatever. That's, that's a vision that not neither here nor there. Are there any questions in this room? Melinda Stanley, Douglas. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Why let's don't see. You repeat the question. Um, the first question was: is how, how, how do we, you know, as the highest-rated scripted drama in A and E's, you know, network history, get canceled? <laughs> um, which is a really good question. Preyed on our, all of our minds there for a little bit. Look at I got to admit, um, it was interesting because what happened was is as uh, it, it was a little bit of a surprise uh, how successful the TV show was. And, um, but A&E &E kind of like figured out really quick that this was, you know, obviously, you know, a bandwagon that they could jump on pretty quick, but they could make a lot more money off of it if they owned it. Um, and so the TV show is actually produced by Warner Brothers. Like that. And so, you know, A&E was the first, you know, home that we had, first network home that we had. And so basically they went to Warner Brothers and said, <laughs> you know, sell us the show. We want to own it. And, you know, Come on, you know, Warner Brothers taught Humphrey Bogart, you know, and James Cagney how to be tough guys. Like, and so their answer to that was, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> and, uh, and so they said, well, if you don't sell the show to us, we'll cancel it. And, you know, Warner Brothers looked at him and said, well, you're going to look kind of stupid canceling the highest rated scripted drama you've ever had. And what I've learned is, is that you can't judge how stupid some television executives can be, like, you know? And uh, by golly, they turned right around and canceled it. Like, and then what they tried to do, what was interesting was, is they, they tried to make it, uh, they tried to come up with some sort of palatable spin, um, which is, you know, the thing to do these days, like, at, on, on, on a bad decision. And so they came out and said it was, it was de the demographic was too old. Uh, the demographic was, you know, over 40, like that, you know? Now, okay, let me tell you something. All my experiences in life, let me tell you who you do not want to piss off, and that's everybody over 40 years of age in the entire country, like, because they've been to the rodeo, like, you know, and so, and they aren't afraid to tell you what they think either, okay, like, and so it turned into this nightmare, you know, for A&E, like, I guess, you know, it turned into this incredible uh, you know, they, they, once they dropped the show, I think the, the ratings dropped like something like 30%, I think. And I don't even know if they've completely recovered from that since, you know, because a lot of people said, well, okay, if you don't care about me as a viewer, look at, then I don't care about you as a network. And, uh, and so, you know, that was, you know, that was kind of like, you know, when we were standing there, you know, with this successful show. And, uh, and amazingly enough, like, I remember sitting there with Peter Roth, like that there at Warner, he was one of the most charming individuals like, you could possibly want to meet. And, uh, and he, he's telling me, he said, you know, well, it looks like, you know, we're going to go with this streaming service is what we're going to go with like that. We're going to jump ship and go with this streaming service. And I remember going, what? Like, and he goes, yeah, it's like, you know, so you can watch TV on your phone and on your computer and all this. And I was like, oh, that's a, we're doomed. You know, we're just doomed. We're never going to, that's the end of our show. Like, well, that was Netflix. Like, so obviously I'm an idiot, you know, and, and don't know a damn thing. So don't ever ask me about any kind of like, you know, <laughs> any kind of stock tips or anything like that. And, uh, and that's, you know, when we got picked up by Netflix, look at, and uh, we had, you know, we were trending on Netflix, you know, for a good three years running, which was pretty wonderful. And then guess what happened? Netflix decided they wanted to buy Longmire. 
and Warner Brothers had done this drill before and said, nope, we're not going to, we're not going to sell it. Like, and so, you know, it, it was a little bit more amicable, you know, uh, uh, ending like that with Netflix, I have to admit. You know, they said, well, okay, well, we're, then we're going to finish up with this sixth season um, and then, you know, we're going to be done like that. And so I did find out, though, that, that Warner Brothers is, you know, in, um, in uh, I guess, the, the uh, construction phase right now of having their own streaming network. <laughs> Um, which kind of might illuminate a little bit of some of the decision-making process. You had a great run on television. We did, we did, we did. <laughs> Another hand, there's a hand. Go ahead. Now what now? Walt's Place. Walt's Place. Oh, the, the cabin itself? Oh, yeah, it's in the caldera up above uh, New Mexico. Uh, not above New Mexico, but up above uh, Los Alamos um, in the national park up there in the caldera. And it's an old national forest uh, cabin is what it is like that they they did an amazing job like people always ask me they say well why did they decide to film a television show that takes place in Wyoming in New Mexico um they they start filming in February you know and so <laughs> you know I can tell you what Wyoming is like right now like you know nobody want to go up there and film a commercial and film even a commercial like that and so um it was funny too like that because uh, the the town itself Durant is uh, Las Vegas New Mexico and uh, I remember being there uh, whenever they first started filming, like, and they were taking down all the New Mexico flags, you know, in the plaza there. And I'm standing there with the New Mexico crew, look at, you know, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, well, it's kind of like, you know, and they're putting up the Wyoming flags, and I'm saying it's, it's kind of like we won the Battle of Colorado, you know. And <laughs> and then my other favorite thing was is they would have uh, these magnetic signs that they would slap over top of the road signs out on the road, you know, so that they would have to dig the signs up or anything. And so they were slapping these things on there. My favorite thing to do at lunchtime was to walk out, you know, when they were letting, you know, traffic go through some of the areas, and you'd see these poor New Mexicans that would look up and see signs that say Durant, Wyoming, Bighorn National Forest just ahead, and they'd be like, what the? <laughs> we're not that lost, are we? Like, you know? <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, it, it's some pretty amazing spots. Like, they did an amazing job, like that of, uh, I've got a little cabin, you know, that's up in the Bighorn uh, National Forest um, that was built, like, in the 1890s, like that, and uh, it looks remarkably like uh, mine. I mean, we sent them, like, I don't know, 600 photographs of all the different locations, you know, all over. And if you ever get a chance, I mean, if you love the books, love the TV show, you should definitely come to Buffalo because, I mean, the Busy Bee Cafe is right there beside Clear Creek, right on Main Street. Um, everything that's just about in the books is, is, is floating around it's there somewhere. It's a fabulous place. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to keep this show going? Or is it going to be uh, for right now, for right now, the show is in a hiatus, like, you know, and Netflix has ended their portion of it. Um, but we'll wait and see, you know, we'll wait and see what's going to happen like that because Warner Brothers still has the rights. Like, and I do know that all of the actors have, you know, gone to Peter Roth's office there in Warner Brothers and made it very clear that they don't think that the stories are over with, so... Longmire Days uh, is, I think, the third week in July, I think, this year, like the 18th, 19th, 20th, somewhere along those lines, something like that. <laughs> you know, so if you want to see some craziness, you know, come on up yes, to that. Yes, <laughs> um, If you think you're going to like them, yes. <laughs> Um, if you don't think so, just jump in anywhere. It doesn't really matter. Okay, but uh, no, I mean there there are a lot of them that you can read as standalone books. As a matter of fact, I pride myself, you know, on trying to write the book so that you can um, leap in and just you know read at any given point. Um, but you know there is obviously you know when you've got you know 15 books, you know two novellas and a and a collection of short stories. There's going to be a you know procedural aspect that's going to evolve those characters as we go along. So, <laughs> okay, one last question. Yes, ma'am. Am I going to write another? <laughs> Let's see. Am I going to write another one? Absolutely. Like, as a matter of fact, I've already got one finished uh, called Land of Wolves, like that, which has already been turned in. Um, and then I'm working on one now that's called The Next to Last Stand, um, which is uh, about a painting. Like that, you might have seen it. Like that, I don't know. You're you're kind of a classy-looking, you know, individual. You may have not seen it. Like that, but just about every saloon or bar in America and in the American West, you know, Anheuser Busch sent out this lithograph, like at the, to sell beer, you know, after after the after the Custer's, you know, last stand. 
and it's uh, Cassili Adams, like, and it's a painting called Custer's uh, Last Fight. And so what happened was this painting was in St. Louis. The saloon that had it went out of business. They owed uh, Anheuser-Busch a bunch of money, and Anheuser-Busch came in and bought the painting, which was like 15 by 9, huge painting. And so they bought it, and then um, they decided, you know what, we can turn this into a marketing deal. Like, and so they started sending out lithographs all over America. And so they're in every bar. Every bar you practically go into, you'll see that painting. And so uh, this went on for like you know, a number of decades, and then finally it kind of petered out. Like, and they gave it as a gift to the 7th Cavalry. Um, which happened to be in Arizona at that point in time. And that was like in 1917, I believe. Like it, and so then later on, I think it was during World War II, like it, they were moved from the 7th Cavalry, was moved to Fort Bliss in Texas. And they took the painting with them. Like it, and it was in the commissary on the wall. Um, the year after the war ended, 1946, the, the building burned to the ground and the painting was lost. Or was it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll, we'll, we're going to have to stop. Oh, am I going to marry Walt off? Like oh. I, you know, I, you know, I, there, that, if there's one thing, there, well, there are two things I probably underestimated. Like at the one was, um, I knew that Walt had to have at least one secret weapon. You know, and. and other than having a sense of humor, like I knew he had to have one secret weapon, and I, you know, I thought, well, you know, in all this age of superheroes and all this kind of stuff, I think I want to give him something a believable superhero ability, like it. And uh, so I made him read. He reads, <laughs> and he remembers everything, and it gives him an advantage. And only those of us, you know, who read know how much of an advantage we have um, by having Walt be a reader. And, uh, and that was one aspect. And then um, the other one was is that, you know, Walt's kind of damaged goods. You know, when the, when the cold dish starts, you know, his wife has been dead for like, you know, four or five years. And he's, he's not gotten over that. And will he get over that? No. No, he probably won't. He probably won't ever get over it. You know, his dog doesn't have a name. His house isn't finished. <laughs> you know, he, he's kind of like person interrupt us, you know, at this point, you know, and uh, I don't know if he'll ever make it, you know, we'll have to wait and see like that. But what's wonderful is, is to see how much of one half of our species um, really cares about that character, that, that nurturing aspect of the, 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 the gentler sex, look at it, is just astounding to me. I get emails every day, you know, about, from women who are just concerned about Walt and that he's going to be okay, <laughs> you know, look at it, and... Uh, it's uh, it's pretty marvelous, I gotta admit. You're gonna end it's, up uh, a romance writer. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, I don't know about we're that. We're at a point. This little machine <laughs> is telling us we have 30 seconds to get off the. You're fabulous. You are. It's really great. <laughs>